Hey, how you doing? It's like a full day. Hey, how you doing over there? Hey, poor Balash, huh? Hello, my friends, and welcome to Between You and Me podcast. This is the place where we talk to music makers about the things that hurt, heal, and change us in church culture. My name is Jessica Morris. I am an Australian music journalist. And you know what? I just, I love good conversations. I love good coffee. And I love good music. And I find that when I hold conversations with musicians and ask them about their stories, I tend to get two of those three things then I just get my coffee and I'm good to go. Anyway, I'm so excited that you are here today uh, for another wonderful conversation with a member of the Christian music industry. And today we are speaking with someone who, well, I didn't know that he'd had such an influence on my life until I started talking to him because Paul Baloch has written some of the most well-known and most well-sung worship songs in the church of our time. Um, since 1992, Paul has been signed to Integrity Music, uh, all when it was very uh, cut and dry and non-fancy and, and less glamorous. And he wrote songs like Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, and Hosanna and God of Wonders, songs like that I have sung many times at different ages over the years. Um, songs that a lot of us might even take for granted because they're just part of the set list, right? Today... Paul sat down to chat with me because he's part of a new project with Integrity Music. It's a collective called Anchor Hymns. Um, He's not spearheading it at all. He's just part of it, a part of this multi-generational, diverse background of artists who want to produce a hymnal quality to the songs that we're singing in the church and want to do it with integrity and authenticity of heart and good quality musicianship. Um, And that's fascinating to me. I'm like, yes, I don't know if the hymn ever went anywhere, but what does it mean for us to bring it back into church? And what does it mean for us to relate to God in this way? So I had a chat to Paul about that, but honestly, we got into so much, so much detail about his story. Paul has some amazing lived experience and insights, and he was so happy to open up and share his story. We also had so much fun swapping accents. So definitely stay around for that. Now, before we get into this, for our new friends who are listening, you're about to hear the who, what, when, where, why of Paul Bolosh, because I love that stuff. It's my bread and butter as a journalist, and it makes things so much easier. Here are the short synopsis. Then we're going to get into the conversation with Paul, and you will hear some of Anchor Hymns tunes and some Paul Bolosh classics, because I got to choose a playlist. All right, here you go, friends. Meet Paul Bolosh. It was the year 1998, and I remember standing on my chair during a Sunday service at my local Church of Christ. Now, from memory, this building is dark and small, but to me, it seemed to contain the world. And when I hear the piano start playing the chords to open the eyes of my heart, my little arms go up in the air and I sing with all the gusto of an eight-year-old Kamusta. This song is a crowd favourite in the little town of Geelong in Victoria, Australia. And while it's not my favourite tune at the time, that would be Shine Jesus Shine, circa 1989 apparently, well, Open the Eyes of My Heart and other songs like Hosanna and Above All would give me, a child, an understanding of the core tenets of the Christian faith and contemporary worship that would shape me to this day. Now, of course, back then, I didn't know that the artist Paul Bolosh was the writer of these iconic songs. But as someone who has been in the church throughout my entire life, His tunes have been a common thread through my faith journey, and most likely yours too. And in 2022, 30 years after Paul Baloch first signed a publishing deal with Integrity Music, he is still at it, crafting and writing songs with authenticity and integrity for the local church. Now trying to wrap up Paul's resume is near impossible. We know I try to do this and it always goes too long. So let's just say that with 20 albums, including two Spanish albums, three Christmas albums, and two collections, Paul has made a long-lasting impact on churches and people's faith journeys across the globe. He began in Camden, New Jersey, and has a stellar New Jersey accent when you ask him to bring it out. And as a kid, Paul grew up Catholic before studying at the Grove Music School in Los Angeles. 
He got married to his fellow musician, Rita, and they had a family. And after moving to become a worship pastor at Community Christian Fellowship in Lindale, Texas in 1989, he was signed to Integrity Music in 92. This was when he released his debut album, He Is Faithful. Now, over the course of his career, Dove nominations and some awards have been plentiful and well-deservedly. In 2002, Paul was nominated for Songwriter of the Year, and he's also received nominations for the song and he also received and he also received nominations for inspirational song of the year for above all in 2002 and 2003 and yes you probably know michael w smith's version of that song which actually won inspirational recorded song of the year for smithing 2003 and it was five years later that paul picked up a dove with michael w smith for their song a new hallelujah which they co-wrote along with michael's wife debbie smith now, in 2013, Paul also received a nod from the GMA Canada Covenant Awards for his French language album, Gloria. And over the years, Paul has also placed on multiple billboard charts. Now, while Paul became a well-respected name in Nashville, where Christian music was booming, he chose to stay at his church in Texas until 2015. What a haul! And this is when he and his wife moved to New York City to be closer to their kids and grandkids. Today... Paul is a champion for the local church, and they're my words, not his. He is committed to crafting and empowering local churches to worship God, and since 1995 has filmed instructional guitar and music tutorials, he's held seminars across the globe, and he even wrote the book God Songs in 2005. It has had multiple printings. Now, many of Paul's songs are ranked as some of the most sung across the globe, according to the music licensing company CCLI. And he has written for or co-written with Matt Redman, Casting Crowns, Rebecca St. James, Phillips Craig and Dean, Kerry Job, Meredith Andrews, Sonic Flood, remember them, Aaron Schuss, Lincoln Brewster, and more. You get the idea. While Paul Bullosh's face hasn't been on the front of all the Christian music magazines, he's been writing the songs that we've been singing for a long, long time. In 2020, Paul released his album Behold Him, featuring his tightest single with Kim Walker-Smith. I love that. And now, in 2022, Paul is part of a new project, his Integrity Music Family. It is called Anchor Hymns, a multi-generational collective of artists creating songs of substance from both a lyrical, theological and musical frame. How good does that sound? Now, this movement of hymnal worship also includes people like Taylor Leonhart, Sandra McCracken, Andrew Singer, and so many more. And their debut EP, Be Unto Your Name, Volume 1, dropped September 25, giving the modern church access to hymnal-style songs that go back to the core of our faith and actually cross the range of our broad, diverse, amazing community. I had the privilege of speaking to Paul about his 30 years in the Christian music industry, we chatted about why he's passionate about anchor hymns and we also got real about why Christians need to be better at communicating with one another when we disagree and why it's not up for us to throw stones about people's motivations and intentions. This was such a joy and such a privilege. My friends, meets Paul Belosh. Forgive me for starting with this, Paul. Is it Paul Belosh? Is that how I say your last name? No. It's so funny because it's a French name. So it's two of my children who ended up in education go by Baloche. If you go to France, it's Paul Baloche. Uh, but really, because I grew up in the Northeast, the way they talk, it's like a way to remember is like, oh my gosh, it's Paul Baloche. So it's can, Baloche. That's a, Australian, Paul Baloche. Great. I can okay. say that so easily. Yeah. Oh. Paul, Paul Baloche. Baloche. Hey, how you doing? It's like a full day. Hey, how you doing over there? Hey, Paul Baloche, huh? Oh, um, I love like, that. Like the French uh, Paul Beloche. Uh, anyway, I don't want to mess you up. But yeah, Beloche. no, that was that was brilliant. I'm imagining people rolling in their graves decades and descendants ago, thinking, "How on earth are they saying my very refined name?" <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, so, Paul, people. I mean, people know of you. A lot of people know you. You've been. I hate to say in the industry for 30 years, you've been worship leading for a long time, but making music for a while. In your own words, who is Paul Belosh? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I am a child of God, right? I am, I am a son. Um, and that's always my first. I remind myself that daily because I am prone to try to find my identity in all the things that I do or have done, right? And uh, and I've been married now 34 years, so I'm a husband. 
I am a dad to three grown children. I am a granddad to uh, four children, four little, little, little ones. And that's hard to imagine. And I was a worship pastor at the same church in Texas for 25 years, continue to sort of pastor worship. Uh, I've been writing songs with Integrity Music. Uh, I signed a contract with them for th- in 1992. So it's 30 years. I'm the only guy left. If you, even the secretaries, the, the vice presidents, the writers, the, they're all gone. And that's the joke around Integrity Music is like, hey, Balash, she's still hanging in there, you know. <laughs> So that's great. You know, I'm thankful that I've been able, you know, to record 15 albums with them, written many songs over the years. Thankfully, some of those have made it into the hearts of believers around the world. Open the eyes of my heart or Hosanna, praises rising, um, your name uh, above all, blah, blah, blah. Uh, forgive me for self-referencing. It's always, who is Paul Balazs? So it's like awkward. Uh, <laughs> No. I'm giving you my bio, but uh, yeah. I, I, one, thank you, a great bio. Two, you, there's nothing indulgent about you self-referencing. Three, for some strange reason, while I was, I was prepping for this, I was like, oh, look at all the songs he's written that I know I grew up singing. As soon as you said that, I went, oh, my gosh, again, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Thank you. So, I mean, thank you for giving. I've grown up in a few different churches over the years. And in yeah. Australia, small little towns in Australia, your songs, God has used them in congregations. So, I like, the correlation is just bizarre and amazing, but I love that. It's love that's part of your story. Absolutely. And, and one of the greatest thrills of my life was touring in Australia, uh, Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne, and uh, across the pond there to Christ Church in Auckland and it was, uh, you know, it's every American's dream to, to go there. So I've been fortunate to be there twice. So, yeah, so delighted to speak with you. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the Um, my main point today for chatting to you was about your, not your project, but a project you're a part of called Anchor Hymns, um, mm-hmm. which I know you are very excited about and working with a sort of a collective of other artists um, yes. to create, I don't even want to say old songs new. You're just you deliver, serving up these beautiful truths about God for an audience. Can you tell me about Anchor Hymns? What is it? How did it start? Yeah, Anchor Hymns um, is part of Integrity Music, if you will, like um, which has been around forever. Integrity, Hosanna Music, all those live worship albums that perhaps some of your listeners have re- recall getting those cassette tapes or CDs back in the day. Um, so this is sort of a, a sort of a, a launch of a new label, if you will, Anchor Hymns, with the idea of uh, writing um, songs that have a hymn-like quality to them. You know, there's many wonderful worship songs around the world that we can sing to, but uh, there's something about when we say the word hymn, it does sort of uh, inspire this sort of notion that there's going to be um, some content, some perhaps some deeper lyrical content. Uh, even the style that it's conveyed in is not necessarily going to be what uh, one of my kids calls stadium rock, you know, stadium praise. You know, it's it's a bit more uh, reflective and, uh, oh, you know, this type of thing you might find in an Anglican church. But I don't want to just sort of pigeonhole it because um, 
I, I've sung in all kinds of churches over the years, and uh, I always love to bring out a good hymn. So it's kind of a modern approach um, to, uh, to try to capture sort of some modern songs that have a hymn-like quality about them. Yeah, beautiful. Where did the idea for Anchor Hymns and this part of Integrity Music come from? And why were you so excited to either, I'm not sure what your part of did you pioneer it or are you part of it? I, I am part of it. I cannot yeah. claim pioneer status, but I so was invited. Can, yes, yeah. of course. Inv- of course. Yeah, of course you were invited. I may mean, expect that. But ha- yeah. how did this, how did this come into being? Like what excites you about being part of this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I was very honored to be invited because most of them are like 30, 40 something, uh, a couple 20 somethings, perhaps, you know, just um, what I consider younger than me um, and just was uh, grateful to just be invited into that. And we would um, we had sort of almost a retreat like setting to write together. So we would break up in groups of two or three in the different rooms and we'd have meals together and prayer times together and worship and laughs and and good hangs, but you know, that we really focused on, you know, getting off into different rooms and writing fresh songs that had like a hymn like quality to it, songs that really would sort of reflect the beauty of Christ. Um, it was just, um, you know, there were some prompts uh, that sort of would kind of get us started at times. And some, we'd either use the prompt or, or we would just walk into the room and someone would have an idea that just really felt strong. So, it's really, uh, I love it. I really love there's integrity, not to, no pun intended, truly, but there's like an integrity about it. Doesn't it just the whole process felt um, like there's some integrity of of heart behind this project. A real, um, I love that it doesn't focus on one artist or one particular person or that. It's it truly is a collective, a community, um, multi generational. Uh, different artists from different denominations, even, you know, if you, if you had to, you know, go around the room and ask, Hey, what church do you attend? What church do you, are you from, et cetera? Like, so I just feel like there was just a lot of um, healthy variety that made up a real diverse community. That makes me really excited too. That Mm. sounds really beautiful and really healthy. Mm, and to yeah. have that in express, not that it's not expressed in worship music, but to have that so intentionally focused in a collection of music that you're creating together, sounds like it could be so life-giving and important for churches across the globe, across so many different denominations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the prayer, that's the prayer for sure. Yeah. That's the open prayer as we, you know, endeavor to roll up your sleeves and let's get to work and let's write something that will serve the church that will glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that will glorify Jesus, um, but will also make it easy for people to find uh, fresh vocabulary to worship him with, mm-hmm. some fresh ideas and images and words that say, like, oh, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, I never thought of saying that to the Lord, yes. So I love yeah. that process, yeah.
hey, are you a creator? Do you like creating fancy slideshows for church? Or maybe you're a videographer, a podcaster like me. Maybe you just love creating things and you need amazing stock music or videos to fill the needs. That is where Soundstripe comes in. The team at Soundstripe are world-class musicians who have hired world-class musicians to create stock music without all the loopholes of licensing. Simply subscribe and you can select what track you want and license it as many times as you want. It's a great way to support artists and create world-class content. We love our friends at Soundstripe. We have been partnered with them since the first episode of Between You and Me, and we are so grateful for their support. If you would like to use their content or check them out, go right now to soundstripe.com and use the code UMEPOD at checkout for 10% off. That is the code UMEPOD at the checkout, and you will get 10% off. You're welcome. Hey, it's me again. Big surprise, I know. But you know what I love? Nearly equally as much as good music. I love a good band tea. And I love a good nostalgic band tea, which is why I'm a big fan of the Between You and Me web store. If you head there right now, you will actually find that we have throwbacks to some of the most iconic Christian musicians and plenty of ammunition for the next catch up with the friends you survived Christian college with or who also survived being a PK with. Go check out our t-shirts, our hoodies, our masks, because that's a thing in 2020, and even our phone covers or notebooks. We would love you to take home a piece of Between You and Me and remember wherever you go that you belong here, that you are a part of a family of misfits and worshippers and questioners and people who apparently like nostalgia. Go and check it out now at our website, betweenyouandmepod.com and hit the shop button. Worship music as a genre has changed and developed a lot since you began with integrity music and what is popular on radio is different to what people sing in churches and it's become a whole more commoditized than before which is I mean one of the reasons I have a job but but uh, it, it's it's a very interesting facet of of Christian music and worship music in in your perspective like even a sound of worship how has that changed over the course of your career and how do you like adapt in your songwriting to sort of meet that but still keep a piece of you in there and keep what you feel is important in there yeah yeah very good question um that is a question i think i've asked myself every two years when it came time to do a a new project um um yeah you know it has changed and yet it hasn't changed i mean yes a lot of things have changed musically and i feel like quite often Praise and worship does mirror a little bit of what's happening in the larger culture musically. Um, not not entirely, but it borrows a little bit. Like you could say in the sort of the late 90s, a lot of worship music had um, a bit of a U2 kind of thing. Like a lot of songs had like a similar beat and jing, a jing, a jing, a jing, a jing, you know, that kind of thing. And then kind of in the double O's, whatever we call them, the uh, 2000s, um, you know, Coldplay, you could kind of hear some of that influence and in some of the writing and the mm. musically, and of course other bands, um, because frankly, in praise and worship, there's within that genre, there are so many styles. So full on urban gospel to more sort of, of Americana, we may call that sort of a Americana country to more of a pop kind of thing To So really worship music is just, expanded that the genre itself really encompasses many musical styles but i think that what we all kind of hope that is that yes on one hand it's wonderful that so many songs are being written but we just hope that um, somehow we can just maintain the heart a sincere heart you know a sincere heart that really does honor the lord that really does uh, because the songs we write will help shape uh, people's view of God almost more than, you know, you can listen to 10 sermons or you'll memorize or you'll, you remember maybe hundreds of songs, but you'll only, maybe you'll only remember 10 sermons or uh, maybe that's not, maybe you'll remember more, but you know, something about a song that would just, it sticks to you. Right. And I think our lyrics really need to uh, be accurate. They need to be biblical and accurate. And, um, 
really, to me, the best worship songs feel like you're praying a sincere prayer to the Lord. You know, I kind of, as a writer, sort of, when I'm close to finishing a song, it's like, does it have that quality to it? Is it the kind of thing that multi-generations could look at the words on a screen, hear the melody once or twice, and kind of pick it up pretty quick, and it would be like a prayer. It would help and act as like a catalyst in their heart toward the Lord. It would give them a vocabulary, a, a phrase, a, an image that perhaps they hadn't thought of before, and that, you know, they're, yeah. So, and that that would help them to worship. that integrity that and again no pun in that integrity that that purity of heart in um in what can like be now now is somewhat like your career how how do you keep it like pure and not performance based or i've got to release another album and make some money to feed my family like is there how, how do you balance that well fortunately i i was at a church that paid a salary. So there was like my base salary I could provide for my family. And when I started writing, there was no, there was things out there like called CCLI, which is like ASCAP or BMI, et cetera. Like there was all these uh, different income streams back then. It was like, we're just in a little church in Texas. We're writing songs for our people, you know, and maybe a custom CD maybe, you know, like, so I think along the way, um, just staying in a small local church, I think that helped me to uh, to keep things in perspective and sure that you know after you've had a few albums out and maybe a song does well and you go oh yeah I kind of see how this works but I'm just always have that awareness that it's all it's all the Lord at any time he could just remove his blessing you know he could just remove his favor I I just always kind of went back to or was aware at least in my for me that it was God's favor. God's blessing and that was something he was sort of allowing me to be part of. And just my job was to be a good steward with that. And, um, and I just at this, you know, I, I try not to, I have a publisher integrity music. I don't pay attention to where my songs are on a chart or this or that. I don't, I figure if they're doing well, they'll let me know. And if they're not, <laughs> yes. doing well, I don't want to be discouraged. Yes. So I, you know, there's, where Jesus talks about not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That, that mindset, at least in my mind is, is trying to keep sort of the, the marketing, the business side of things that I don't want to be naive or, or foolish or um, I like the word stewardship. I I like that word, but I I don't want that to enter into the creative prayerful um, process of trying to write a sincere prayer to the Lord that others can sing, writing songs for the church. I really want those things to be separate. I don't want that thought to enter in to my mind. And so I just try 
but I'm human, right? So I, this image I had years ago, I said, it's kind of like if you have a one of those big dogs, like a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler, and you just, it's a dog that could, look, could get out of control, but you just keep an eye on it and you say, stay, sit, stay. And you're just aware that dog is uh, like equated to my ego, if you will. And I'll say this to worship leaders and songwriters, like just keep it in check. Just just be aware. Don't kid yourself that you're not, that, that you're above that, that it could never, that thing could never overtake you. Just be aware that that ego is in the room. That dog is in the room with you. Keep an eye on it. Keep it in check. Stay, sit. Good boy. All right. Stay there. Uh-huh. You know, yes. if you follow my analogy there. That's a great analogy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. You mentioned to me before I hit record um, that you chose, when you and your family moved from Texas, you chose to move to New York City, which is where um, members of your family are. And, and you chose that over, because we were talking about Nashville, you chose to move there over Nashville where I I had just assumed that you live there because it's where Christian music is Christian music is made a lot of it. Um, yeah. can, so can you tell me why did you choose to plant in New York City? Why m- remove yourself in a sense from that environment of industry? Um. Yeah, for me, I've always. Uh, enjoyed or felt it was healthy for my soul to to go into Nashville for a couple days to meet with this person or that person or maybe to co-write or maybe meet with the record company and do all that sort of stuff. But then it was just healthy for me to get on a plane and, and leave all that and not be in the middle of uh, kind of the business marketing side of all that. And I'm not even trying to throw stones at that. I it's a quite a, an important, it's an important aspect of getting these songs that are written out to the world, out into people's cars and homes and, and to bless them. So that it's, it's a necessary apparatus, if you will. Um, but, you know, like anything, it can be kind of overdone. It can be exploited. It can be, uh, um, it can leave a bad taste in your mouth, you know, and, uh, and so I think most most of the people there involved in Christian music have the right heart, and they would see themselves as doing something almost almost ministry like, someone even in marketing or et cetera. Um, and then there's like in any industry, there's a handful of uh, perhaps not, you know. And it's not my job to sort of pick out the good ones and the bad ones. Jesus said, "Let the wheat and the tares let them grow up together, and leave it up to God." <laughs> Thank God. So Thank God for that, yes. Right. Amen. It's not my job to go around trying to decide who's who's authentic, who's not, who's sincere, who's in this for the money, who's not. Who knows? I don't know. What if we're wrong? So it's, I just want to keep an eye on my own heart. And uh, yeah, so for us moving to New York, um, of course, a lot of it was family. Uh, two of our adult kids ended up there. One was finishing school. Uh, one was already working there and um, and it was just within a, an hour and a half of where we grew up, my wife and I. So we had extended family just an hour and a half away. And it just seemed like, hey, let's do something crazy. Let's sell our house in Texas that we, where we've been for 25 years and let's get a little one bedroom apartment, just a little tiny thing. And uh, let's see what this feels like. And so it was a fun you know, it's been a fun season and I've plugged in with many different churches that I've had relationship with over the years from Brooklyn Tabernacle to, uh, I won't name, you know, just a bunch of various. And, and I consider that a, such a, an honor because they're on sort of the spectrum of some would be more conservative and charismatic. Some would be more sort of considered progressive or uh, maybe more Anglican, et cetera. You know, and I, I just like having friends in both camps. Uh, so everything's so polarized. I'm just determined by God's grace to just continue to just hang on to friends in both camps and try to be uh, a unifier, you know, and, uh, just as a father, as a sort of that, that attitude of just, I want to keep my family together. We may not agree on every issue and we may have some, dis- but that doesn't mean we just separate or throw bombs at each other and sling mud at each uh, or slander one another. I, I, it's just very disturbing, uh, especially in the U.S. the last few years. 
to just sort of demonize and uh, one another because of maybe where you you may fall or lean a little bit politically, you know, and you just sort of demonize the other side. And I'm like, hey, man, make make friends with some people on the other side and see they're frankly, they're not that much different than you. They hold a few different opinions. But frankly, the way you actually live your life is not much different. So, you know, don't don't be self-righteous and think you're like that much better. Um, you know, let's just let's bring a little humility to that process or process, as you may say. And um, anyway, that's don't want to get off on that tangent, but I have found myself trying to be, you know, because I am maybe one of an older guy in the in the body of Christ, you know, if I have any influence at all, that's going to be continue to be my encouragement is to not to give up on or to slander, uh, but, but get to know uh, and make sure you have friends that are not don't think exactly like you or do everything exactly like you. But, you know, make sure that you ha- you're part of a diverse thinking, not just a diverse skin color, but also a diverse thinking, you know, so. And we do we do love the diversity of New York City and uh, all all things diverse. So um, it's challenging at times, and it's uh, um, and it's inspiring at times. So. I really, I know that you was you said that was a tangent, but I really appreciated that. Um, and you spoke with so much tact and honesty and kindness. I mean, it's something that we, I think, the church experiences in many places. I know that when I lived in in, in the states, it was something I was so conscious of because I have, if I have very strong opinions about something, I can't just assume that other people have the same one, or I can't. It's like, how do I not? be offended or chained like how does that work and I had to learn very quickly that it wasn't people are just bad and good I know that sounds really naive but I I had to learn very quickly oh wait like in this church who I'm called to love people have different opinions but there are still really good people on all sides because it's a big spectrum yeah Yeah. thank you yeah that was a big learning curve yeah, because and I find myself and many of us are self-censoring. You know, we 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 kind of bite our tongue in half because you you're afraid to like step in, even asking a question about some social issue, just even questioning or asking a question or you know trying to get a perspective that might be different than you. Even just that can sometimes uh, invoke some kind of wrath, <laughs> intense intensity so i think a lot of us have sort of chosen the self censor route route um but because we're we're afraid to just let our guard down because we'll maybe be attacked yeah. or misunderstood misunderstood let's say so i i just long for again the desire to to um to be curious about how people arrive at some of their points of view how did you arrive at that how do, what is your you know I, I think we should ask questions and listen to one another um rather than demonize just try to understand and of course you can always pick the most radical crazy person on this side or the most radical but that doesn't really represent there's a large middle most people are somewhere they either lean a little left they lean a little right and they have their reasons so how about we try to 
the Bible says, come, let us reason together. You know, like that, how about that kind of a, of a heart? And I, frankly, even within the 12 disciples, I, I just think if I may, sometimes I, I picture like the, uh, Peter, the fisherman, kind of a small business person, fisherman, salt of the earth, you know, rough and tumble, you know, kind of a guy, you know. Um, and then you've got Matthew, which, you know, the tax collector in America is called the the IRS, the Internal Revenue that Service. That would have been a situation in the yeah. <laughs> you know, Imagine some of their dialogue yeah. and some of their arguments and like, I don't trust that guy and I don't trust him and I don't like that his kind. And so right there, just within 12, you know, there's, yeah. and I would like to think that, come on, come on, church, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's rise up a little bit. Let's, let's, let's rise to the occasion and like the disciples learn to wrestle with this. Um, but with the foundation, frankly, just like a good marriage, you don't agree on everything as you, you know, the first year or two is all oh, great. But as time goes on, you know, more and more, there's things where maybe you have a different way of approaching something or a different point of view or a different this, or even whether it comes to parenting or you name it. And, um, but, but a healthy marriage, you can sort of have these discussions and disagreements because you have the, the, the commitment, the foundation of commitment is there. Yeah. And I think if we are committed to one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord, if there's that safety net of commitment, that I'm not going to run away from you. I want to understand how you came to that, you know, to this point of view. And, and would you like to hear, would you like to understand me at all? Or, you know, what is it? St. Francis was the one, uh, make me a channel of your peace. Let me, um, and where there's a uh, oh, massacre that I never see. Oh, master, grant that I may never cease uh, so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. So the idea is like we want to understand, but we also want to be understood. There's that desire. Let's, yeah. I'm really going off on a tangent, haven't I? So I know. I love this. This is great. This feels like having coffee. This is brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I I resonate with so much of what you're saying. I'm challenged by it in a really great way, Um, and I'm also really thankful for it. Thank you. We have we have listeners who probably like will cross uh, a range of denominations, perspectives, people who are in the church, people who have left the church, and so I think. My, my perspective, they'll tell me if I'm wrong, and my perspective is that they they will probably actually really appreciate the fact that you're holding that space, holding that space for conversation because how can yeah. we love each other if we don't have that conversation? We can't. We can't. And it's so easy to just, like, isolate ourselves, which is which is our default. We isolate ourselves. We get on our phones or our computer, and we, are, we enter this phony world of Twitter or social media where it's just easy to be like, yeah. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, we yeah, just like capital gang letters. Up, yes, just gang up on the other side, and uh, and yet, if you were to just walk walk out of your house and get to know some of your neighbors and get to know some of the people at your church, and you get to know how they live their life and some of the amazing things they do and they've done, and then you go, oh wait, but hold on, wait, they didn't vote for the same person I did. How how can they actually be a a decent person. What happened here? You know? So it's like, exactly. That's why I think it's so important for us to get back in the church, like with our bodies <laughs> and our minds and our spirits and not just be isolated. I mean, there's a place of course for online church and all that. That's fine. We can hear a sermon, we can hear a podcast, and but there's nothing like being in a, we were in the same church 25 years, went through three pastors, went through two or three church splits and my wife and I and a handful of us just decided we're hanging in here because I'm committed to that couple and I'm committed to that family. And I'm committed to that person and that teenager. And these are people I've, I've been growing up with in the Lord. And I'm, I'm staying right here. I, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to if, if half of y'all leave, we're, we're staying here. And so we, we did that a few times. And I just know what it's like to go through. It's painful, but. You know, if we're committed to to one another, if we say we are, I mean, that that's, you know, Jesus, how many times has he commanded us to love as he loves, to lay down our life, to, 
to serve. How about love our enemies? Maybe you have a hard time with what I'm saying and you're like, but these people, you don't understand, Paul. These people, you don't under, like, you know, because my Twitter feed says this and this and this about them. So it must be true. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, well, then here's one for you. If you're a Jesus follower, love your enemies. Oh, you know, ouch. So, sure. It's easy to love the people that agree with us, think like us, that look like us. Nice little bubble. And that's what social media has become. But, man, that's what the local church is. The beauty of it is the diversity. The Everything together. coming together. Oh, come on. Yeah, around the person of Jesus. So that's the thing. It's impossible. And I don't think it happens anywhere else in the world. People of multi-generations, multi you know, coming together in the name of Jesus, around the person of Christ. What is it about Jesus, Jesus Christ? That is what makes us brothers and sisters, is those when we've made him our Lord and our Savior. And, oh gosh, so many times over the many years of that church, there were people I thought I would say, I would never hang out with that guy. I would never do anything. I wouldn't be in the same room with those people. And yet, you know, I was an elder. He was an elder. Da, da, da. I disagree. And yet, but because of Jesus, we were in the same room. We would worship together. We would pray together. We'd often disagree on many things. And, and yet I loved that, you know, in hindsight. I didn't love it oftentimes in the midst of it. But uh, after the fact, I would go, you know, I need that. My, my ego needs that. I, I don't want to surround myself with a bunch of people just like me. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong. You heal our brokenness inside and give us life. The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling. Love that. And it was timely. And uh, yes, I resonate. But it's one of the reasons right. I started this podcast, because when I was living in Nashville, I was at a, I think it was a Good Friday event. And I, and I was in an arena and I was watching people eat popcorn while Chris Tomlin played this beautiful song. And I was judging them so badly. And I was making all these assumptions in my head, just like social media, making assumptions, being like, I bet I know this and this. And I went and I had this sense of God saying, Jessica, you are one of those people. Like that is your church. Um, and it's such a sense of being like, you can't, you can't demonize people. You need to hear people's stories. Um, and so uh, that, that challenge, it's everyday challenge, but it's a, I, I often find it easier to love people outside the church than in the church. Um, sure. And um, sure. and, and so hearing this, I'm like, yeah, I get that. And there's space to wrestle with that, but to be able to do it in a really healthy way where you mm -hmm. still practice loving one another and disagreeing in a really healthy way, it's great. And that's my soapbox. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I have I've got one more question for you. This has been yes. great. But yes. if yes. you could go back to 1992 when you signed yes. your first publishing deal with Integrity, Mm -hmm. What would you say to Paul, knowing what you know now? I don't know, but that was interesting that it just, did you see that? Did you see my face? Uh, that just hit some emotion in me and kind of moved me. I don't know why. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I'm just kind of sitting with that. I've learned to just kind of sit with when something like that happens and go, huh. Why, Lord? Where did that come from? <laughs> um, I think it might come from, you know, when we look back on our younger selves, um, hopefully we can have some compassion and some grace for our younger selves 
who, uh, when we were so certain of, of, of certain things, uh, we were so certain and so sure. And so, uh, things were going to be this way and this is the way it was going to be, had it all kind of figured out in your head and, uh, tried to control everything. So, um, yeah, just so much anxiety and stress uh, in that young guy who was starting a young family and leading worship at a little church and fighting my own my own personal battles and battles uh, in a church and battling insecurities and you know trying to uh, discern what is my role in the church and what is my calling and how do I work hard at that and do it well and with the right heart, blah, blah, blah. So all the, I would just look back at that young guy and just say, you know, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Like, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, Yeah. Don't be so hard on yourself because when we're hard on ourselves, we tend to be hard on others too. And, um, when we learn to extend grace, more grace to ourselves, we tend to extend grace much easier to others. So, yeah, wow. I'm going to sit with that question because <laughs> it might be something deeper even, but uh, I'm trying to make it relevant to those that might be listening to. Uh, of course. And I appreciate that. As one, you don't have to share that. You don't have to share anything personal, so it's a privilege to even chat. But um, Mm. there are so many layers to our stories and they're for different people at different times Mm -hmm. in different ways. So thank you for being willing to share that, that level of vulnerability and emotion with me and with other people. It means a lot that you trusted me with that Mm. moment. Granted, we just met, so thank you. Yes. You are oh. welcome. And I think that's a good exercise for us all to, to as we as we bring this to a close, that's something for us to, to consider over the next few days and weeks is pick a number, pick, pick the five-year-old version of yourself, pick the 11-year-old version of yourself. And what would you say, right? Pick the 16-year-old version of yourself and think about where you were and what was going on. And maybe some of it was horrible. Some of it was maybe wonderful, uh, but it's it's worth revisiting, eh? To go to go back to some of those uh, benchmarks in our life, and actually putting an age, right? It's really kind of interesting when you when you put an age and and think of that person, and just maybe that's a good prayer exercise, and like almost pray, not to sound weird, but it's like a prayer exercise where you sort of imagine that 11 year old version of yourself as best as you can. And what grade were you in and who was your teacher and what was going on? Who were your friends and what did you do? But maybe, maybe something will rise up in that and just pray for that version of yourself, that 11 year old, you know, have kindness and compassion for that 16 year old version, that 22 year old version of yourself that, you know, So I think that would be a, a good prayer exercise.
was so wonderful. We had so many scheduling conflicts with this bizarre stuff and it was so great because when Paul and I finally sit down and we see each other's faces on the screen and we chat, there's no awkwardness or anything. Paul is so approachable. He's like, you got time. I appreciated how comfortable Paul made me feel. He was so genuinely interested in me and my story, which I mean, I appreciate it. You don't have to be. We're just, we're doing a routine media interview, but it speaks a lot for me when someone asks about that. Um, and I just had fun swapping accents. Honestly, I wasn't even swapping. Don't try and make me speak a different accent. We all know that I, I am so bad at that. I am so bad at that. Um, I think I can say Coke and that's about it in American. Though once I said that, and I think they said I ordered coffee. I digress. Friends, you need to go and get Anchor Him's EP right now. It is out at all major streaming outlets. Stream it, buy it. If you're a worship leader, add it to your church catalogue. These are easy to sing songs. Some of them are classic, some of them are new. And um, I was listening to them on my way to this interview this morning and it just stilled my heart in a really peace-filled way, which I needed. So yes, go and check out Anchor Hymns. You can also connect with them online at... Are you ready? Anchor hymns. And if you can't understand that because of my Australian accents, that is A-N-C-H-O-R-H-Y-M-N-S. You can also visit their website, which is actually affiliated with Integrity Music at, are you ready? Integritymusic.com forward slash anchor dash hymns. Um, all of those links as per usual, are in the show notes, including the tracks and everything that we played. So you can figure out who sung what and when, and honestly, just go and get the EP. Now you can also connect with Paul personally and say, Hey Paul, great story. Been singing your song since I was like five. Thanks Paul. Appreciate you. Like me. Um, I've got so much tact today. So you can connect with Paul Belosh on Instagram at Paul Belosh. That is P-A-U-L-B-A-L-O-C-H-E. He's also on Twitter at Paul Belosh and on Facebook. I think he's more active on social media than I am. Nice. There you go. So go and connect with Paul. Now, his per latest personal album, Behold Him, uh, which actually features the duet with Kim Walker Smith, is also out now. So if you want, like, pure Paul music, you can go and download that album or any of his 30 years worth and just jam out to that. Sounds great. Cool. So that is all for this episode. Please remember to come and say hi at Between You Me Pod. You can also check us out online at Between You and Me Pod.com for all our latest episodes and links and new releases and all those fun things. That's all. My name is Jessica Morris. I will see you very shortly for another episode. Until then, here's to hope. Keep having the same old dream that I'm drowning in the sea. Waves are rising all around, flood as far as I can see. And all the sudden, Wrapped up in light I hear the heavens cry My son, build yourself an ark Let me heal your broken heart So when the flood waters rise And the sun goes Safe in my
here is still small.